from Temple. So they were able to work it out. You know, in baseball terms, you come to us for the first two innings. There's a whole game. You got the whole rest of the game. Then you can go to call of me. So I'm here, and I'm thrilled to be here. Because I was able to, thank you. I was able to be here when we said an amazing, loving tribute to Rabbi Weiner. Put your hand up, the Rabbi Emeritus. <laughs> to be able to come and honor Tom and Shira, because they are just spectacular rabbis and friends. And then to be able to come at the beginning of this exciting new tenure for Rabbi Fenster, I mean, this is just what I dream of, and I'm just thrilled to be here. Let me also say that the whole focus for this week's Parsha, and there's a lot to talk about. I assume that's tomorrow morning. We're going to talk a lot about the Parsha. But the, the, the portion begins, Bayom Hashmini. On the eighth day, they consecrated a whole new group of leaders, which reminds us that the essence of Jewish life then, now, yesterday, tomorrow, it's all about leadership. And this congregation has been very blessed with leaders because I can actually go back. When I was the rabbinic intern at Westchester Reformed Temple before Rabbi Tom Weiner was the rabbinic intern, <laughs> just pointing that out, there's a, a, a synergy between what goes on over there, what goes on over here. I remember Rabbi Stern said, you know, you got to get Rabbi Davis to come do this big program. I said, well, I don't know Rabbi Davis. He just said, just tell him that Rabbi Stern said you should call. So I called Rabbi Davis, I was this Pisher kid in rabbinical school, and he said, oh, Rabbi Stern's synagogue? I'll be there. When, when do you need me? When I came as the new rabbi of Reform Temple, I went out to lunch with Rabbi uh, Mark Weiner, and he took one look at me, he says, I used to be the tallest rabbi in Westchester. <laughs> I said, so is that a welcome? <laughs> and... Um, so I really feel blessed to have relationships and a sense of this congregation. Can I just tell you a secret? Are we live streaming? Zoe? Yeah. We are? Okay, so just keep this between us. <laughs> you know, and a few friends maybe who are watching or listening. I've actually been to Kol Ami more since I'm at the, at the URJ than that congregation two miles. <laughs> I, I don't know that that's going to help. But I just want you to know that actually is true. And um, can I just say it's beautiful to see not just these two great congregations, but the, the synergy that goes on and the, the sense of we're a community to hear about what's happening here on Monday night, to be able to host really the whole community. That's also a statement of what this congregation is. But if I could, if I could also say a word about lay leaders, because I just mentioned the great rabbinic leadership. This congregation has sent more amazing lay leaders to the URJ, I think, than probably any of our other congregations. And you didn't just send us people. You sent us amazing people. So um, I would just make sure to say, of course, Lisa Borowitz. Where's Lisa? I, I walk in. <laughs> Ronnie Cohen. Where's Ronnie? Over here. And I'm going to say, Ellen Bittner, just put your hand over your heart. Put your hand over your heart. Lots of love to Ellen. Susan Cohn, where's Susan? Where's Susan? Coming, by the way, to the North American board, we're going to install her as part of the North American board a week from Monday morning. And then there's this guy, Hank Ruda, is he still around? Is he still here? Where's Hank? So Hank, whatever you said, I'm sure was true. Hank is going to be the new co-treasurer of the entire URJ. So can I just say, I don't know where we'd be without Cole on me. But we would not have the strength of the leaders that you have shared. And that's just the most recently. You could go back, you could go back your hundred years. You've been sending us amazing leaders. 
So let me just get back to the parsha for one minute. I just have one teaching of the parsha, which is going to frame the whole, the whole talk I want to give. So it turns out, in the opening of the parsha, they consecrate the new priests. They are the, they are the leaders of the day. And on their first day on the job, they did something so objectionable that Nadav and Avihu, two of that inner circle, are literally consumed in fire, and they die. Now, when, when I was first ordained a rabbi, I never liked that portion. <laughs> the guy, they were just brand new. They didn't even know where the bathrooms were. And they did something so objectionable that they had to be consumed in fire. And I kept thinking to myself, what if I forget to ask the congregation to rise? When the, what, if I, what if I offered the wrong prayer and the wrong... What happens? And, of course, one of the great 19th century Orthodox rabbis, Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, said, do you know what Nadav and Avihu are? They're the, um, they're the biblical antecedents to the reform movement because they are bringing innovations to Jewish life, and they shouldn't. I'm here to say that the only reason you're 100 years old, we as a URJ are 150 years old, the only way we're here is because innovation has been built into the DNA of who we are. We have never said whatever we have done, Dayenu, it's enough. There's always a change in adapting. Cineplex, did you, where in the Torah does it talk about Cineplex? <laughs> It, it came out of a whole synagogue transformation movement to say, could we turn Friday night into more than a tefillah? Could we turn it into community? Tefillah, learning, a meal, a togetherness. Could we, can we do things differently? And that, of course, is the whole secret of this reform movement that has been not just a part of our past, but will be part of our future in some very exciting ways. Is, is innovation dangerous or is it essential? Why don't you ask the people at Blockbuster? <laughs> Anybody used to go to Blockbuster to get those movies and then like, you know, four days later it's sitting on your kitchen table and like, ugh, you, would you take it back? I won't take it back. Anybody here remember Kodak? <laughs> Anybody remember AOL? I mean, the truth is, the places and the businesses and the organizations that have not adapted and kept themselves growing and changing, they disappear. But we're not like that, and we're not going to allow it to happen. Turns out this guy, Isaac Merowise, who was, of course, the founder not only of the UAHC in 1873, but also the Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, it was only then HUC, 1875. 1889, he founds the Central Conference of American Rabbis. One guy. Now, before he started the UHC, he was a rabbi in Albany, and he wanted to try out some innovation. So what was the first thing that he tried to do? He looked out at the congregation. This is an Orthodox congregation, and the men are sitting in one side, and in the back away are the women. So he had an idea, a really brilliant idea. How are you going to break the mechitza. You don't just break it and tell everybody. He said, you know what we're going to create? A family pew. Who could be against families sitting together in shul? Could, could anybody be opposed to it? Like, what a natural, obvious thing. It was perfect. Except, do you think they love that change? <laughs> oh, my God. And he had a bunch of others as well. But he was just getting started. And it turns out they... Um, they fired him. But it was right before Rosh Hashanah, which is cruel. It's cruel. It's cruel to do it the way they did it. But he had nowhere to go but that temple where they had just fired him. So he came on Rosh Hashanah, and this was a shul where you actually bought aliyahs for people. So a nice person who loved him and felt badly that it's all had happened bought him the aliyah to open the ark. So it came to that time in the service. He went up to open the ark. And the president of the synagogue, by the way, presidents, raise your hand if you're a president, past president of the synagogue. Okay, just listen to this. <laughs> the president of the synagogue blocked 
Isaac, Rabbi Isaac Merwise, the founder of Reformed Judaism in North America, from coming up for his aliyah and knocked him down. So, again, the moral of the story could be, be careful about making innovations. Like, people don't always like it. But it turns out that is part of our DNA. So when Rabbi Maurice Eisendrath was president of the UAHC, he was a courageous change leader. And one of the many changes that he made was in 1952, a group of Chicago Jews came to him and they said, Rabbi Eisendrath, we think the reform movement should get into summer camps. He said, at first, summer camps? We're a religious movement. We do synagogues, we do prayer books, we do learning, we do social justice, but summer camps? And they said, it's already paid for. <laughs> he said, okay, let's, <laughs> let's try. Turned out to be one of the most brilliant things that changed so much of our movement. That was Asrui, Walk, Wisconsin. Rabbi, Rabbi Alexander Schindler, a blessed memory, one of the most creative and agitational change leaders in Jewish life ever. What did he do in the 1970s when everybody was saying about interfaith marriage, stay away. Just this is, you know, they would use words like it's a shanda and they would scold. Rabbi Schindler said, that's not, that's not what we do. We don't do this. We do this. We want those interfaith families to come be a part of us. He changed the definition of who was Jewish. Patrilineal descent, right? If your mother or your father is Jewish and you chose to be part of the Jewish community, you're part of us. Does anybody have an idea how that was received in the wider Jewish world? <laughs> this man was vilified everywhere, including within the movement. People said, you are going to end the Jewish people and you're going to literally kill the Jewish tradition. He said, I think it may turn out to be the most important thing we can do. So this is just a few of the innovations that have changed Jewish life. I would just ask, what are some of the other innovations? And again, Professor Umansky's here, so if we get stuck, <laughs> we can always just ask Ellen to like fill in the blank. But I, I know Kola Me, this is not like a group of you know, uh, B-minus students here. This, you, you know your Judaism, you know your Reform Judaism. What are some of the most important innovations? Again, don't worry about pinning it to a person. What are some of the most important things we as a movement have brought to Jewish life that have really helped shape and reshape the Jewish community as we know it today? What are some of those innovations? Music. Music. Certainly, I, I mean, I can't be at call me and not think of Debbie Friedman being here all those, all those unbelievable services, the healing services. So the music, which came through our youth movement and our summer camps, revitalized prayer and revitalized what ritual would be. Yes? Thank you, women rabbis. Uh, in fact, can, you even, can we even imagine where we would be? And by the way, this past year at HUC graduation in New York, they asked Rabbi Sarah Horowitz, the first Orthodox woman ordained to be the speaker at graduation. She got up and she said, you know, I wouldn't be here as the first Orthodox woman rabbi if it had not been for Rabbi Sally Prezan in 1972. Well, Rabbi Prezan was in the audience and she did not know. And it was an acknowledgement that our movement hasn't just shaped our movement. It's helped to shape and reshape Jewish life. That's part of what we've done. Oh, uh, give me one more. Yes. Adult B'nai Mitzvah. Adult B'nai Mitzvah. Now, I would love to claim that. <laughs> it may be, in fact, that you could find the first adult B'nai Mitzvah in a Reformed synagogue. I'm not sure exactly. What I know is it's a phenomenal thing. And again, the idea that we can renew ritual. Ritual doesn't define us. It, it allows us to live our Jewish values. So that was a, a perfect example of something that, how could it have taken so long, right? Anybody else? Did one more? Praying in, Praying in English. Thank you. Praying in the language of our community. By the way, I was at Kol Shema once on a Shabbat morning in Jerusalem, 
And this woman is screaming at Rabbi Levi Kelman, I mean, at the top of her lungs. And I walked over, because Rabbi Levi, long-time founding rabbi, I walked over, I felt bad, you know, I'm a rabbi, Someone's, my, my buddy's getting yelled at. So I, I go over and I just try to, like, you know, appear. And she's yelling at him in English. She said, I thought this was a reform synagogue. I came all the way from New York. I was told this was a reform synagogue. And I get here, and it's all in Hebrew. You can't make this up. And Rabbi Levy, probably a lot like this rabbi, just gave her a hug. You're not, you're not going to make you're not going to make a winning argument to that person. The last thing I want to say is Rabbi Jack Stern, of blessed memory, who was my mentor, and I believe also Rabbi Tom would say his mentor as well. When Rabbi Stern retired, I, the Friday night is vivid to me. He got up and he said, "You know, I'm really appreciating all of the loving words about my rabbinate over the last 30 years." I really appreciate people talking about how proud you are that I marched with Dr. King and I was down for the Mississippi summer and I was a, a clarion voice uh, about the Vietnam War. He said, but I do have to correct the record. When I was doing those things, this congregation wasn't entirely proud of me. And then he said, so your new rabbi is going to do things that at first you're not going to think are things that you support. And it may be when he retires, you will have already moved and moved to a place of appreciation. So make space for a new rabbi to be a bold leader and to do things that may not be obvious at first how right they are or how prophetic his witness will be but give him the chance to be that rabbi that he needs to be. So I, I'm not Rabbi Stern, and this is a rabbi who doesn't need that message, but I say make sure to give him the space to do what he needs to do, even if it doesn't yet make sense. Um, you want to know, because I, I saw the title, you'd like me to tell you the future of Reform Judaism. Do you, do you really want to know that? <laughs> um, first of all, anybody would stand here and tell you they know what it's going to be is just not being honest. We, none of us know. And by the way, it's not up to me. It's not up to a group of rabbis. It's all of us. What are we trying to shape? So I'm not going to stand here tonight and tell you exactly where this thing is going. I'm going to tell you some things that I believe are essential, maybe endangered, maybe at this point just nascent, but the things that we have got to be paying attention to as we build that vibrant Jewish future together. So the first thing I wanted to say, which is huge, is who's the we when we talk about us? Who is the we? Turns out if you ask the Pew survey people, and they do these surveys every, I always like, like the Pew survey, like they're talking about pews. But it's actually a family name. And they say there's one group in North America that's the largest by far. Do you know what, what group of Jews in North America is the largest group by far? Unaffiliated, beautiful. I like to call them the uh, not yet connected. <laughs> the organized largest group happens to be the reform movement. Larger than the Orthodox, conservative, reconstructed Judaism combined, which doesn't make us better, it just gives us a sense of where the whole community is. And it turns out the Pew says there are two million people who identify with the Judaism that we live. Two million people don't belong to reform synagogues. There may be hundreds of thousands who are not yet connected, but they identify with us. How many people think that's a huge opportunity? That there are all these people walking around saying, I'm not exactly sure where I fit, but I, I think that reform movement, that's what, I, that's what I gravitate towards. So if people already feel that there's something about what we are, what we stand for, what we do, that's like them or what they want, we got to figure out how we connect them. And we're doing not an A-plus job on figuring out other ways for people to connect, right? It used to be we were kidding at, at dinner 
that sometimes it used to be that the first thing that happened, if on a Friday night you saw somebody walk into synagogue that you didn't know, you pull out a membership application <laughs> and go, hi, what's your name? You want to join? <laughs> Turns out a lot of the young people in particular today, that's not actually the most um, helpful way to begin. Usually, hello, <laughs> Shabbat Shalom, um, welcome. So again, but many people, when you ask them, do they feel connected, they say yes. And then you ask them, are you affiliated in any specific way, they might say no. We have to expand how we think about how people connect, particularly younger people who make it really clear that they are not necessarily ready to buy into the way we've organized Jewish life. Doesn't mean they don't want to buy into the Jewish tradition, the Jewish community, but the institutional structures of Jewish life are not lined up for liberal Protestants, liberal Jews. Um, that's just not the way this next generation is wired. So rather than just give up, we're thinking of different ways to actually find them, connect them, find doorways, windows, open hearts, open minds, be more connected. Now, there are a lot of people who are not convinced that we really want them. Who are the people in Jewish life today who feel like they may be on the margins of our community and that people actually don't want them necessarily to be part of the heart of our movement? Who are those people? It's not a rhetorical question. Who are those people who are on the margins who actually might help make up the two million people um, and some of them actually would love to be with us, but we haven't opened the doors or the conceptual frameworks for them to come in. Who are, who are some of those people who have been on the edge of Jewish community? Non-white Jews. Thank you, non-white Jews, right? It's a huge category, a growing category, particularly among young people. If you look at the 18 to 30 demographic, over a quarter, over a quarter of Jews of that age are people of color. That's, a, that's not a little factoid. That's a huge segment. And guess what's going to happen to the generation after that? It's going to be larger. So that's a huge group. And again, during COVID, a lot of them were able to test the waters. They came and live streamed, came and said, wow, that's an amazing synagogue. I think I could feel comfortable there. But walking in the door takes enormous amount of courage. Who else is still on the margins? Yeah. LGBTQ. LGBTQ. Yes. But may I say also, we all could do better. I remember, as the Rabbi Westchester Reformed Temple, Kola Mi was leading the way by being a place that was more inclusive than almost all of our other congregations. But there still is not a clear sense that all of our spaces are doing this, right? That's also not a small segment. It's a huge segment and could be part of our strength. Yes? People with disabilities. People with disabilities. And again, that's all of us at some point in our lives, right? And some, again, that's, that's a huge segment. That's, a, that's either a fifth or a quarter. It's a huge segment. Also, people's talents and ideas are not going to be part of us because they're not in. Yes? Thank you. People can't aff afford because the cost of Jewish life is expensive. And we very often say it doesn't matter what you can pay, but people feel uncomfortable that maybe there's a, a threshold that they can't meet. Again, for, for us, I know, call me, there's a, a feeling of come, be part of us. But that message of the Jewish community, you know, it has a cost, and that may be one of those key areas. Anybody else got something that's burning? Yeah. Beautiful. So 
formerly conservative, formerly orthodox, formerly Yiddish socialist, formerly something else. Turns out that's the majority of Reformed Jews today were something else when they were born or growing up or come from a different faith tradition. We have unbelievable strength from those who've chosen to be part of the Jewish family. And people who are Jewishly adjacent, they're part of a Jewish family. They're not technically Jewish, but they're part of our family. Again, the two million turns out to be the largest swath of young people and, and their parents and their grandparents. We could be growing, and I don't want us to grow just for the sake of growing, but just think of our incredible vitality. Think of all that smarts and all that justice commitment that would come to us if we could grow to our full size. So again, that's just one of those things in Jewish life. And, and you hear endlessly people talking about, you know, the demise and the, you know, the sort of the last person out, turn out the lights. But it turns out that the last person out is a, a, a Jewish fear. I don't think it's what we're going to see. Can I also say, can we just for a moment, when people don't join the synagogue, we sometimes have a rationale for why they don't join. Uh, I remember there was a, uh, a guy who, who left the synagogue, Westchester Reformed Temple, and I, I felt really badly. I, you know, we had celebrated B'nai Mitzvah together. I had done sad, day, sad life cycle for them. And he said, no, no, Rabbi, we, we loved our time at Westchester Reformed Temple, but we're, we're leaving. I said, well, are you moving? I said, we're not moving. They live, literally, I could throw a football from Westchester Reformed Temple, land in their front yard. So, um, and I would drive to the synagogue pretty much every, you know, day, and if there are times where this person would wave to me, you know, very, very friendly, very warm. And I think to myself, I couldn't stay a member of the synagogue, you know? And 10 years later, he calls me. He said, Rick, I need you. My dad died. Um, We're going to get there, I promise you. If I don't get the anti-Semitism, you get your money back, okay? <laughs> I promise you, promise you. Um, so he, he said, I need you. And of course, there's a, what, is, what do rabbis say in that moment? Oh, now you need me. <laughs> For 10 years, you could wave to me, now you need me. And I wasn't proud of that response. So I, again, I couldn't do the funeral. I, I got him a rabbi to do the funeral. But why are people not connected? I think we in the Jewish world have stories about the people who are not connected. We say they don't, they don't care, they, um, they're, uh, they're too busy. We, we have stories, but the truth is, you know, we're not about you have to join. How do the people already belong? even if you're not formally a part of us. So again, how do, we, how do we change those narratives so that we can actually be the community that we're trying to be? And I know that we have many, many different ways to do it. So I want to just, a couple of more things I want to say, and then we're going to have a chance to, to dialogue with Rabbi Fenster, because he actually knows where the Jewish future is going, because he's going to be building it with you. <laughs> I'm being very serious. This is not going to be an idea or a seminar. This this rabbi, with all of you, is going to help shape the Jewish future, and you'll be a beacon of what it could be because of what you do together. But I do want to say that synagogues have been the most adaptive uh, institution that any Jewish community has ever created. Think of 100 years ago what was similar and not similar to the synagogues of today. Does anybody know how in the 19th century we, we basically financed synagogues? We didn't have dues. We didn't have tuition. So how did they do it? They rented the pews. So at Temple Emanuel of Fifth Avenue, you know, it's a nice little place. <laughs> they got all the money they needed by renting the pews. So the second row here would be the Schwartzes. This is what this is was the Lefkowitzes were here, and then the Cohens, and then the da-da-da-da. And they got all the money they needed to run everything about the synagogue through that methodology. By the way, uh, Hank, are you, were you ever the treasurer here? No. So you don't know what you're going to do? You're going to be the treasurer of the whole before a movement? <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Did we know that? <laughs> ah, I, I, I guess you try it out, put them in charge of like, you know, $90 million. Go for it, go for it. Do you, at, at uh, Kolomit, do you 
raise the revenue you need to run this magnificent synagogue through the rental of, do, of, of pews? No, nobody does. It's not how we do it today. In fact, we have a whole evolving way that we are financing the way synagogues do their work. So very often, voluntary dues, different models of different approaches to how we think about funding. How about in terms of um, thinking about 150 years ago, did synagogues all have religious school wings? No. The places were about prayer, maybe some other uh, related things. So we've evolved what the synagogue is. And so for us, we need to evolve it further. But we need a place where Jews pray, study, care for one another, and stand up for what's just in the world. We always will need such places, and this will be one of those models that will help show the Jewish world that synagogues still matter greatly, and they are still the places that must change, change, change. Um, I was invited to debate a candidate for chief rabbi in the Knesset in Israel. It was kind of a gladiator thing. <laughs> I, I'm not really sure why I said yes, but we literally were debating in front of the whole Knesset. And he said to me, when it was his turn, he said, you invented tikkun olam. <laughs> I thought to myself, well, maybe you'll call my mom. <laughs> My mom would actually believe that I could. But then I said to him, do you have a Tanakh? Do you have a Hebrew Bible? There's no part of our Jewish tradition that doesn't live a commitment to social justice. Uh, your rabbi spent good time at the Religious Action Center in Washington, D.C. He knows that justice is not ancillary to Jewish life. It's essential. We all know that. The Reform movement didn't invent tikkun olam, didn't invent social justice, but we made sure that it was in the very aorta of what we are doing. And today there are people who say, you know what, we, we gotta like, you know, that's all too political. We need to do less of that. The truth is we need to keep doing that because we live in a very unjust world. And our God is in a, a God who is, um, he, he, the, the God we love is really, really, um, impatient with injustice. We have statewide projects. Raise your hand if you know about RAC New York. So the RAC isn't just in DC, it's now in 10 different states. And in Ohio this year, we actually won reproductive freedom as a, uh, an amazing victory. And a large part of that victory was RAC Ohio, fighting with the whole coalition. Here in New York, we're taking on our, our challenges and we're doing it in places where we can really build the kind of future that we need. We're also told because anti-Semitism is not peripheral, it's everywhere. So here I'm just gonna make sure that we know that anti-Semitism is something that isn't in the history books, it's not in your family's history, it's everywhere around us. And it comes from the left, it comes from the right, and it's scary. And it's something that many of us thought we would not be facing in this 21st century. Some of you know that um, we have a whole network to try and keep our congregations safer. This past June, I was in Providence, Rhode Island, and my phone rang. It was about to have Shabbat services. It was Rabbi Hara Person, who's the chief executive of the Central Conference of American Rabbis. She said, in Macon, Georgia, Temple Beth Israel is, uh, is now surrounded by neo-Nazis. What do they do? So we quickly got the network to respond, the Secure Communities Network, SCN, the ADL, the FBI, they all descended and were able to help make the, the synagogue secure for Shabbat. The next day, spontaneously, the whole community showed up and had a rally for the synagogue. There were the Christian leaders and the Muslim leaders and the Hindu leaders and the Buddhist leaders to say, you will not do this to any of us. It was an amazing expression of solidarity. Today, of course, we're nervous that in the post-October 7th world, some of those people who stood with us are maybe not so quick to stand with us. And I just want to say, I think those relationships are there. They can be rebuilt. They can be strengthened. They must be. We will not be secure only with cameras, only with security guards. 
Our security is gonna be in the solidarity and the connectedness of our communities. And I know that's something that you here at Colony are building. I wanna end with a couple of reflections before I have a dialogue with your brilliant rabbi. Israel is on all of our minds and in all of our hearts. And this has been, this has been an unbelievably difficult time. And it's been a time when we feel uh, trauma, we feel brokenness, and we are trying to find our way. It turns out that 91%, this is a study that I just was able to uh, meet with a researcher yesterday, 91% of American Jews support the aims of this war against Hamas, 91%. Turns out that about 89% have empathy for Israel's suffering and also for the suffering of civilians in Gaza. So this idea that we have to say, whose side are we on? We're, we're clearly on the side of our Israel. At the same time, we can't see what we see happening in Gaza and not feel our own sense of responsibility. Judaism doesn't teach us only to care for ourselves. So I just would say one of the things that I've done over the last three months is meet with a lot of young, progressive, reformed Jews who are really angry at the reform movement. They believe that we have an obligation to declare ceasefire now, ceasefire now, and some have said, you need to really publicly condemn them. I said, could we instead meet with them? Could we talk to them? A group of them are the children of our rabbis, our reform rabbis. If you saw the, the list, they're the rabbis many of us know and love and have admired, and their kids are holding a very deep commitment to a Jewish teaching of we're all part of God's family. And we were meeting with one of the groups, and uh, one of the young people said, Rabbi Jacobs, do you know one of Hillel's questions? I said, well, Hillel had many questions. What question are you referring to? He said, if I am only for myself, what am I? I said, he did say that. But do you know what he said right before that? Im ein anili mili. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm not caring for the Jewish people, who's going to care for the Jewish people? So it's not one or the other, it's both. And I think many of us are struggling, and some of us are really nervous about Seder this year, because some of the people coming to Seder may have a very different idea, and we're nervous that it's going to get really uncomfortable. So we're trying to figure out how do we make sure to hold our community together. Last thing I'll just say before we close and we get into dialogue is, we also learned yesterday that this moment has seen a surge of people interested in Jewish life. More people are coming since October 7th to services, to classes. More people are converting to Judaism. 40% of those surveys said they are now more engaged in Jewish life than they were on October 6th and before. You gotta explain that to me. It's, it's not obvious that that would happen. It's potentially something that will help transform. And which group? is the largest group of now more engaged than before, the reform movement. It was an unbelievable statistic in this recent survey. So this is an opportunity for us. So uh, I'm not going to conclude. I, I am going to say that when we get to the Shana Haba Yerushalayim, the end of our Seder, it's not just going to be a song, but it's going to be go around the table. What's the hope for the day after? What is it that we hope for, not just in the year ahead? What is it that we hope for Israel and our people in the coming year, in the coming years. And this is a moment for us to reimagine. It may be a moment where things are stirred so much that there's more opportunity for change and growth, even in the trauma and the pain of this moment. That is going to be part of our opportunity. <clears throat> so with that, I want to say, um, would you come on up here, Rabbi Fenster? And can we say thank you? No, we can't. We can't. No, we're not done yet. Oh, done. Okay. Come on, come on. So, uh oh, sit, stand. Let's sit. Let's sit. Okay, let's. These are comfy chairs. I don't sit in the brown. I'm 
Uh, thank you for that presentation um, and the really thoughtful way that we to, to look back and look forward. Um, I appreciate it in particular the way that you talked about growth, not just for the sake of more numbers, but growth in the service of mission. And I think that a, a big question that I'm asking, and, and I, I think is important for us as a movement to ask, is what is that mission? Like, mm -hmm. to grow, growth for the purpose of what, and what is it that we're hoping to build and create and offer to people uh, in, their, in, in, the, in the context both of congregational and communal living, but also as individuals, particularly in the emerging world that we're living in, both the post-October 7, post-COVID uh, digital age and, and what, um, what we need to continue building and creating for people. So I'm curious, what, as from, from where you've sat with the, the broad view of, of the movement in American Judaism, what's the, what's the what? Gr grow, in, grow in the service of what? People are hungry for more meaning in their lives, yeah. more purpose. They don't need to be busy. They don't need another thing that they have to do. They want to find, we all do. And I think people have awakened to that hunger, that, that yearning for something more. And that is a communal experience. And Torah is one of those anchors. Spiritual practice is one of the ways that we live out holy moments and make it our way through the darkest moments. So I think those are fundamental needs that we have. And I think that sometimes we get stuck in the institutional structures and we forget what is that ikar, what is mm -hmm. that essence that actually made you want to be yep. a lifelong servant of the Jewish people, made me want to do the very same. Everybody who's here has been called into, no one has to join, no one has to be a part. We're here because we, we give something and we mm -hmm. receive something so profound. And that to me is only underscored by the moment that we're living in. I, uh, a couple of years ago, I did a, a certificate program with the, the Lilly School of Philanthropy at Indiana University. It was an executive certificate in religious fundraising. Um, it was all on Zoom and I was the only Jew on the screen. Uh, and we were talking about, about ways that our synagogue, that our, our, our churches and synagogue raised funds. And I talked about dues models and they were all flabbergasted because none of them have dues models. That's not how churches work. Correct. Um, and it was, we had a really, and in the research that we looked at, and especially in the, the emerging reality of synagogue life, one of the challenges we had is that the, the language, the word dues is a really hard, icky word. Because dues, especially from, from an internal perspective, it's dues are what you owe us mm -hmm. for the thing, for, for the service that we will provide you. And, like, and we need to, we'll, we'll need to find better words, but I think it's also a perspective on how how we make, what the assumptions we make about synagogue life. And you, you spoke about that as well, that it's not like, oh, people are gonna come because they ought to and they have to, but how do we also build a thing that's not, well, you owe us, but rather that to build communities and relationship opportunities and inspiration that people want to be a part of, they want to be contributors to, they want to, right. not just Sedaka, but they want to be, they, they, they want to be the builders and the co-creators of, of what the future looks like. Um, uh, my, my last year of rabbinical school, I took a, I audited with Professor Joe Sklute, um, History of Reformed Judaism. We learned about was in the, in the 1840s in Germany. The origins of the reform movement were lay. It was, it was a movement not invented by rabbis who had this brilliant new halachic Jewish legal perspective, but it was lay people who wanted to have a different aesthetic, who wanted to have a different, a different vibe, a different feel to their communities. It took the rabbis time to catch up. I think that in the, and I think we're, especially post-COVID, we've seen a shift yep. towards the hyper-professionalization of synagogue life. Um, and I appreciated not just that you identified some of the leaders in this congregation, and I was hopeful we'd do a little more roasting of Hank Ruda, but we think we did, it was sufficient for now. I don't want to talk um, him out of it. <laughs> we need him. Um, but I, I wonder what, from, from where you sit, what do you, what innovation do you see coming from lay people? And like, wh where, do, where are the lay driving the, the shifts and growth and evolution of our movement? Well, it turns out, I'll, I'll just start at the URJ. When I, by the way, I was a very happy rabbi. I did not look yeah. to leave Western Reform Temple. I, I, I thought I would be blessed to spend my entire career serving that community. And um, so someone called me and said, would you, are you thinking of applying for this job? I said, I have the greatest job. I love what I do. 
why would I, why would I do something like that? And, and it needs probably a huge reimagination. I don't think people really in the leadership, the lay leadership mm -hmm. are looking for that. So why don't you come interview? So I came for the interview. It was a three-hour interview, the first interview. Three-hour interview. Uh, and they said at the end, the last 20 minutes, they said, you get to ask us a question. I said, how much can we change? Mm -hmm. Not just in the union, but in our movement. And the lay people, without really hesitation, said, we need to change dramatically. Otherwise, we're going to lose this moment. I, I was stunned at the readiness of the lay leadership. Mm. I had a, a wonderful, large staff. The lay leaders saw more clearly that the structures that we had served us beautifully, yeah. but no longer were serving us in that way. So I think the innovation a lot of our lay leaders um, bring is, first of all, that we don't only want professionals leading the Jewish community. Right. Um, you know, I remember, you know, when we had lay people leading minyanim for, mm. for families in mourning, people said, oh, the rabbi is too busy. I said, no, this is all of us taking care it's of one another. That's a theological it's a, it's a, it's, vision of community. It's what yeah. we do for each other, and you can't designate somebody yeah. to do that. So I think we have lay people who, not just in the 19th century, but <laughs> today, who are right. really the people who can see how we build and create that kind of community in partnership with rabbis, sacred partnership, and with cantors. And, um, you know, I think that is just, when we see a healthy congregation, it's because there's a partnership, not because one is strong and one is not. It's when it comes together. And I think that, you know, even the idea of, you know, um, thinking about different ways to pray. I, I look at your prayer book. Yeah. And I know, I know Rabbi Shira, you know, that was a labor of love. I think it didn't start at the, at the lift. Right? Yeah. Who's I'm, I'm pointing at Myra, who I know was, the, the, your name is as an editor of a something. And other, other name, other people whose just names just are here too. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of the inspirations yeah. for the whole movement to use other prayer books. So again, that was a partnership of a lot of people who love to pray and said, we want other modalities, other readings, other ways to do it. And you just did it. And it already kind of sent into the ripple of the before movement. There are different things already being tried. And I think that culture of can we try that? Maybe it'll turn out to be really powerful. Can we make mistakes because we tried something that didn't turn out to be so, so amazingly effective? But I think that partnership and that ownership that the Jewish tradition doesn't belong to the rabbis or the scholars, yeah. it belongs to all of us. There's a reading about that in Mishkan Tefillah on the, on the Eliud Varim page. They don't know that, but I know that, I know that page. I'll, sh I'll share that page with you from my prayer book another time. That's a good one. Um, I, uh, so we're sitting here, I'm remembering being in the CL, which is the, the basement, the, the, the lobby, the basement lobby of, of Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute, in Jewish Institute of Religion at 1 West 4th. Uh, and you, I'm, a presentation, my second or third year of rabbinical school. And you told us, ready, fire, aim. Um, which was, again, like a re really empowering as a student, that you have to have ideas and you have to try. Because we can't, keep doing the things we've always been doing. It's, the things we're doing are good, they're working, but also if we want to grow and evolve for the, for the next generations and to make the synagogue relevant in the world as it is, we have to be brave enough to try new things, knowing sometimes we'll fail, but some, sometimes we'll hit the target. I'm curious, um, and that was, that was probably you know, 10 years ago or so, I'm curious how, how have you tried Ready, Fire, Aim uh, in, 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 as the movement, and what are you seeing uh, successful in synagogues in that frame? So I think the ready, fire, aim is exactly the thing that just makes you at first hear it and go, well, that can't be right. I mean, ready, aim, fire. I mean, do, do all the things and then know. Because the truth is we can't always know. This is also what I think a lot of the people lead change as a, as a profession and teach change. So I think one of the things, listen, that we have more not yet connected. Mm. Again, unaffiliated, I always think makes them the problem as opposed to what, what, what have we not done to help connect more yeah. people. But I, I think we've tried multiple things, to be honest. I, I can't think we've gotten even close to figuring out all the ways that we can connect more people. Um, you know, I, I, I had this idea, this was before the Boston Biennial, that we would start a, um, a project to 
basically help couples find rabbis mm. from the movement. Yeah. Not from the yellow pages or from the internet, but from our movement and connect them. I thought it was just an obvious way to bring more people at a critical moment when they're looking. It turned out there were so many institutional blockers. And even within the movement, mm. there were so many of the yeah. different arms who said, that you can't do. So we basically just said, you know what? We could try to force our way. We said, you know what? We learned something. Yeah. We experimented. And we, we, we regrouped. But the idea is still the right idea. How are we going to find people who are not raising their hands saying, I'm looking for this, but actually would resonate with some connection to the Jewish community? Yeah. And to make that not something you do you know, on your own with Google, but that the movement is looking for you. It's offering you what you might need to make your Jewish life more whole. And if you're marrying someone who's not Jewish, that's not a scold. It's a chance it's for a us love. to embrace yeah. and to love you into that. So that was a big initiative. Turned out not to be a successful one. Uh, we also failed quickly. Mm. As opposed to pouring money and, and, and investing in something, it was not succeeding. And wonderful colleagues, both lay and professional, said, let's try, let's try to come at it from a different side. Yeah. But I appreciate No one said, how dare you have tried? Yeah. Because we needed to try. Well, and it's it's scientific method, right? You have to form a hypothesis, try, learn something, and what are the values, the things you learn from there? I'm, um, <laughs> I, you know, part of the reason I'm like, I, the reason I'm a rabbi and a synagogue rabbi is I believe in the institution of synagogues. I think synagogues matter. I think synagogues can continue to matter if we're willing to let synagogues evolve into what they need to be in the next moment. It's, I think that. You know, it, m- in my child, I think it was like towards the height of, of synagogue um, attendance and maybe not like, attendance and engagement, like right around like synagogue 2000 time when like when when there was like synagogues were doing interesting and cool things, and I think that and I I, I think that Larry Hoffman taught us we we in a synagogue uh, synagogue studies class he said that especially in areas of relative Jewish density. 50 people are going to bounce between this synagogue and that synagogue every year. And we tend to fight over those 50 people because if I get 20 of them, my numbers look way better and my budget, this and that. And like, what a waste of energy we're doing fighting over the 50 people who are going to bounce when there's so many people who we haven't even touched yet. And rather than, and I think what's like, what, I'm, what I'm really excited about, excited about especially being here in Westchester with the incredible colleagues that I've already met, um, particularly the, the colleagues of our movement, is we don't have to be proprietary about Jewish life. These are my Jews, you can't have them. Like, there's, there's too much to do to worry about that and rather how we can work together as movement institutions with vision, knowing that, knowing that each synagogue is different, has a different flavor and celebrate, celebrate what happens in the different pockets of Westchester so we, to, to build a, a community like where rising tide lifts all boats, where all of us are working together to engage more of like, uh, Christians have good words, like the unchurched, right? the unaffiliated unchurched, the, the folks who haven't found their way in the doors. How do we, how do we make a, a cultural shift that people want to become part of synagogues, not just my synagogue, but synagogues more broadly? And that when we do that, m- maybe we'll get 12 and they'll get 23, but like, okay. I, the, it's not in service of the numbers. It's in service of, of the mission and of meaning and purpose. That's a mindset that just has to change. I was at the yeah. BBYO convention. Mm. This is about nine years ago. And um, right before we brought the nifty leadership of our reform Jewish youth group to the BYO convention to meet with their leaders. But the meeting was set up that only people like me were in the outside, we could listen, but we weren't to talk. And the nifty officers and the BYO officers sat cool. in a circle and they figured out in five minutes that the rivalry that they had been either taught or internalized was ridiculous. Wow. Because together, all the young people in BBYO and in Nifty amounted to maybe 5% of Jewish teens in North America. They said, why would we fight over the same teens when there are so many teens who are connected to nothing? Why don't we figure out our superpowers and why don't we act in more concert? And they led to having the convention together, Nifty and BBYO. Again, that was a heretical 
Certainly there was rivalry. My, that was, that would, that, that's, that still it feels a little bit like heresy to me, but I'm trying to open my, I hear open my heart to you a little bit, I too. Hear I hear you. that. That's great. Yeah. Uh, but it turned out for that particular um, yeah, international convention, the president of BYO was a, a young woman who grew up at Westchester Reformed Temple. Her parents mm -hmm. are here now. Okay. So I just say, it's not... Yeah. You're at Colomy, not at Westchester Reformed Temple. Beautiful. Have you yeah, found... Thank uh, God. While, while I was leaving WRT... People called me over as I had to walk out during the service. They said, our kids are at Call of Me. <laughs> <laughs> Say hi. Like that's, going like, beautiful. Like, that's what I was doing in the Chicago suburbs. One, like, oh, you're Temple Jeremiah? Rabbi Rachel Heaps is amazing. How lucky are you to have her as your rabbi? Not like, oh, no, you're le like, you found a synagogue home. Thank God. Thank God. Yeah. And that's a mindset of abundance. It's a mindset of sharing. Yes. It's a mindset of collaboration. And frankly, find a spiritual home wherever you find it. I remember people would come to join Western Reformed Temple. I said, did you go to Kol Ami? I said, are you pushing us away? I said, no, no. Have you, do you know where Beit Am Shalom is? Have you been there? By the way, did you go maybe yeah. to Woodlands? Have you checked out? And they like going, are you selling are you doing? everybody yeah, right. else? Of course. I said, I want you to come here if it's the right, if it's the right place fit, for you. Be the right place. Yeah. And you have good choices here. When, and and you, I love that when you talked about the, super, the, the kids sitting around talking about this, finding their superpowers. So no, um, many of you met Rabbi Karen Kadar, who was my mentor when she was here for installation. She, she talks a lot about leadership. Um, and one of the, her, she has a leadership list. Um, one of the things on her leadership list is she said that the job of the leader is to convene genius. Uh, it's not if, and she also says that if it's as big as you, it's not big enough. And that the job of the leader, particularly because like, we're talking like the balance of lay and professional and clergy, is that it's, it's not about the rabbi. It's the rabbi having a responsibility to convene the genius of the people in the community um, so that it, the thing that we create is bigger. That, like, as, and I've, I've said to many of you, all of you, many times, this is not and will never be Jason's shul. It's not. It's, it's yours. It's your shul that I am privileged and, in, and contracted to serve. Um, but it's, uh, and it's our job to find the shared genius so that we make something that's bigger than ourselves worthy of, worthy of the, this like wild, ever-changing moment that we're in, um, which, is a, which is a big task. But if, it's, if, we're, if we're not doing something big, then we're probably wasting everybody's time. Totally. Yeah. And I think, to be honest, this is a moment where um, all hands on deck yeah. to think about the way that you know, we can make our communities both safe and places where we can live the diversity that the rest of American society is not doing a good job. The hyper-partisan, the divisive, uh, angry, vitriolic politic that is consuming us. If our synagogues be places where we actually can find a place for difference to be blessed and honored, yeah. and that we find a way to live in that harmony that is not easily found, that will be redemptive, and there's not another place right now the, in America. And, like, and that's our tradition. Like, we can be teachers. We have to be teachers of that. We have to be teachers of being able to hold multiple truths, to be able to disagree vehemently, but like Hillel and Shammai did, still marry each other's kids and eat at each other's tables. Um, that if we're not that, it, that feeding into a, a, a culture of divisiveness is, is and it's not Jewish. The Jewish is we're going to disagree and we're going to come here for civil, thoughtful, loving discourse and dialogue to build to build towards the next thing. And can we do it on the things that really matter? Yep. I find that we have synagogues Oof. that are trying to avoid anything that could be contentious. Well, the it's still my first year. We're not doing too much contentious right now. <laughs> Should we do a little now? It would be good. <laughs> but the truth is, if we can't do contentious with respect yeah. and depth, we can't do the things can't that do really it. matter. And those things have to be, and they're not easy to do. And I'm guessing that you're going to help this community, which already has great DNA, Yes, God bless Shir and Tom have created a, a space that's safe, that can celebrate the differences, and that we can figure out together. The subject of Israel, no, nobody is neutral right now right. on the subject of Israel. All of us have intensity and sometimes really sharp disagreements, mm -hmm. and uh, that is part of this territory. But we're not going to help the Jewish people or our community if we can't find a way to have that discussion. Yeah. And we, to me, we're going to have to try it out at Seder because, and we have this new initiative called Talk for Change. Yeah, it's beautiful. Which the truth is, figure out what you can, what you can ask that isn't just about arguing, you know, the points that are already critical 
but step back and create a space where, A, I can hear something quite different. And by the way, with those young folks that I talked about, mm -hmm. it was a lot of hard work to just try and create a space where it wasn't, you're wrong, here are the seven reasons why you're wrong, I'm right, can actually sometimes, not only can you have a both and, but you, like the brilliance of, of Hillel Shammai isn't Elu, but Elu, these, and it's together. Yep those ideas. Hillel, Hillel teaches Shammai before Hillel teaches Hillel. And together yeah. they make up actually what we need. But I, I see that, Amen. you know, the synagogues where the rabbi says, can't give political sermons. I say, what's a political sermon? You talk about mm -hmm. justice, you talk about poverty. Yeah. What, what is a political sermon? I don't understand. Isaiah Torah. did not know what a political sermon was. I once got up and I, I told people <laughs> uh, this whole um, paragraph of ideas and people said, there you go. You are, you are polarizing our community. I said, do you, I actually want to admit, I didn't write those words. Turn where to page did, 242. Where did you find them? I said, I found them in the book of Isaiah. Yeah. And I just read you a paragraph from the book of Isaiah, which is about the things that matter most. And it's not partisan. It's actually part yeah. of the marrow. But it's just not happening around us. Can I share with you my most blasphemous idea? Go, right, go. Good. What don't, could happen? Don't tell them. What could happen, you know, for the new rabbi? I, I, so the, the Haftarah on Yom Kippur is Isaiah, is, is this the fast that I will choose? And what Isaiah says is like, what are you doing? You're like bowing your head like a reed. Woe is me. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was so terrible. But like you're oppressing your workers. There are hungry people. There are destitute poor. There are people who don't have a home. Like, what are you doing? Um, someday, someday, I wonder like, what if we, didn't ha what if we canceled Yom Kippur services? But we still, but it still had the same emotive obligation to attend. And instead of come to shul, fast and spend the day at the soup kitchen. What if it was fast and uh, Habitat for I don't know what like Habitat for Humanities or go to D.C. and walk to every office you can. Like wh whatever the thing. Like what if we did what Isaiah said on that day? rather than come and bow our head like a reed? What if we actually, tr that we didn't just come here to say the thing, but made the day about doing it? That, that's the most, I don't know, like year, year eight, year eight, year eight. But you'd still give a Yom Kippur sermon. Oh, well, that's why I went to school for five years, so, I can, so, they, can, so they can listen to me talk for 20 minutes. So, by the, <laughs> so if, that's your, if that's heretical, yeah. I, I think that's not, that's not out of bounds. Like, again, what are the yeah. things that are going to make Judaism more alive, more essential to what we do every it's day? It's a religion of mitzvahs. It's a, it's a, we're, a, we're a faith tradition of hands and ideas and discourse and conversation and dialogue, but, but of, of the stuff that we do, of the stuff that we do. Jess, I don't know what time it is. I didn't look at my watch. I'm a, how, how far over are we? 9.35. 30? Oh, that's it? Only 9.30. What, what time are we supposed to be done? I've only done like three cineplexes so far. Now? <laughs> Do you have a closing thought, Rabbi? <laughs> uh, my closing thought is how excited I am not only to be here in this beginning beautiful period of your rabbinate at Kol Ami, but to see the energy and the love that exudes from you. Mm. Even your beautiful teaching during tefillah. You know, the Torah is not a thing. It's a part of you. And you just bring that love of not just the Torah, but of the people. I just have to say, I'm by nature a pretty hopeful person. Mm. It's not a hopeful moment in the life of the Jewish people. Yeah. But I sense that with the amazing lay leaders and community that Kol Ami is, has been, and will be, that this is going to be a synergy of your leadership, your ideas, your heretical thoughts. <laughs> And the Jewish future that's beckoning us, that doesn't have road signs, it doesn't have distances, it doesn't have a GPS to get you where the Jewish future is, but I have this very deep confidence that you are going to be um, not just a remarkable rabbi here at Kol Ami, but for that's our great. movement and for our people. And yeah. that, my friend, is a blessing. You Amen. are a blessing. You. This congregation is a blessing. <laughs> Thank you. Let's, I have like I, I have I have two or three sermons to say in response, but I'll keep it to half of one for now. A, th a thing that I that I've felt and known since since I want to say since July first, but really since since December ish, 
um, is that I, I know that this moment, this like, <laughs> How like not only is Sharon Tom reti retiring, but also the hundredth anniversary is like this like really drastic pivot moment in the congregation. Is that I I know that like my 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 body, my voice, my like my style is like is different than what Shira and Tom were. But what I and are excuse me and are and are were on the beam and in, in their leadership of this congregation. But what I've found so compelling and the reason that Gavi and I knew that this is where we had to be, is that there's, the heart is the same. That the, the, the insistence on a Judaism that is relevant, that is compassionate, that is, in, that is engaging and inspiring, that there's, like, that there's a scarlet thread that, that I feel tied to Shira and Tom for what, for what they built and sustained with all of you for all those decades, that I both, I, I get to inherit and carry uh, that that feels connected for where for where we're going next, and like and as I've, I I don't know I don't know what's next. There aren't there aren't road signs, but I know that it's um. I know that it's Sinai. I know that it's it's the moment of of revelation and inspiration and mission of of who we are and where we're going, and and I'm um, I'm so deeply grateful for your time and for you, dancing at two weddings tonight. So thank you, thank you. You're free to go home. Shabbat shalom. <laughs>